Good evening, work issue. I, I welcome all of you to CSBM's web lecture today. This is our, uh, that is, Center for Studies on Borders and Movements special memorial lecture session, which is in memory of Sri Mira Bhattacharya and Hiran Shankar Bhattacharya. I would like to say a few words on CSBM before we begin. Center for Studies on Borders and Movement came up sometime in November 2018 as a research NGO by a few like-minded women researchers in Kolkata. Since then, we have tried to remain academically active in various ways. Starting from scratch at CSBM, we have been organizing lectures, workshops, interactive sessions, panel discussions, etc. We have uh, organized research methodology workshop focusing on partition, migration of labor, and refugee movement. We are happy to say that uh, the research methodology workshop is becoming somewhat popular. We have tried to continue with our academic activities also during the lockdown, rather in a later part of the lockdown, utilizing the online platform on a more or less regular basis. Prior to lockdown, we had workshops on TA and NRC, focusing on Assam. We had documentary film show sessions on detention centers in European cities, on Bangladeshi migrants and cross-border refugees, and also organized discussions in social and cultural histories of several indigenous communities. We have worked with Jadapur University, Rabindra Bharati University, and West Bengal State University through collaborative research projects and jointly conducted workshops. Team CSBM comprises scholars across various disciplines, across universities, and across regions who um, the members eagerly participate in this little endeavor of ours. We have been trying to explore the different conceptual and empirical issues on the notion of both border and movement and into extending their meaning beyond their usual connotations. Presently, we have just completed a collaborative study on food movement in West Bengal, 1959 to 1966. And as of now, we have a small library come uh, make do kind of office. And we also have plans regarding publications. Anyway, so much for now. Today, on behalf of CSBM, I welcome the eminent scholars, Professor Bashobi Fraser. She is today's speaker, and Professor Jayati Gupto, she is today's chair. Both graciously consented to participate when we approached them, and I am immensely thankful to both of them for that. We are very happy and proud to have you, have both of you with us today. Before Professor Fraser's lecture, I would ask Nondini, Nondini Bhattacharya, um, a member of CSBM to say a few words on Sri Meera Bhattacharya and Kiran Shankar Bhattacharya, who are her parents and in whose memory this lecture has been organized. In fact, it was uh, Nondini's proposal to uh, organize this lecture by Professor Fraser quite some time ago, and uh, we all had readily agreed, but only we could uh, do it now. I would like to uh, briefly introduce Professor Jayati Gupta, and then I request her to take up the role of chairperson for this session. Jayati Gupta was formerly professor of English at West Bengal State University, Barashat. A large part of her teaching career was spent at the erstwhile Presidency College, Kolkata. She specializes in 18th century literature and finds passionate scholarly interest in varied forms of travel, travel writing. 
Her tenure in 2015-17 at the National Library, Kolkata, as Tagore National Fellow for Cultural Research, Ministry of Culture, Government of India, enabled her to work on a project titled The Cultures of Travel in Bengal. Her book, Travel Culture, Travel Writing and Bengali Women, 1870 to 1940, has been published in late 2020 by Routledge UK, and the South Asia edition has been published earlier this year. She is currently working on the second book on women travelers commissioned by Routledge. She works as visiting faculty at MS University, Barashat. Over to Professor Jayati Gut. Yeah, thank you, uh, Shati, for uh, this uh, lovely introduction. And uh, I think I will ask Nondini to say something about uh, her parents in whose uh, memory this lecture is being uh, held. Thank you, Jayati Uh I would like to have a one page presentation of my parents' photographic images. So. No, but why is it no, not coming? But anyway, the scope is not coming. The option is not coming. I don't know why. But maybe uh, then, Nondini, you can say something about your parents and... Uh... Yes, I will. I, I'm going for that only directly. Uh, good evening and good afternoon the August gathering, uh, respected chairperson and esteemed speaker of today, Bashavidi. Uh, my heartfelt greetings to you all. It is a very special moment for me as we decide to come together to commemorate a very special couple, Kiran Shankar Bhattacharjo and Meera Bhattacharjo Kanjilal, who happen to be my parents. Survivors of partition uprooted and forced to leave their homeland at their early youth. They had joined the brigade of East Bengal community in their struggle for existence, which made them so relevant to be commemorated in this particular platform of CSBM, Center for Studies on Borders and Movements. Yes, they belonged to the educated middle class and therefore had enough, quote unquote, cultural capital to resuscitate their position in the hapless condition they were thrown into by the political scramble of the final decade of the colonial rule. However, what was special about this couple is that their struggle did not begin or end with recovering their own position against all odds and challenges thrown upon. In fact, that experience had galvanized their characters as upright fighters to support and encourage people to sustain and recover various distress and challenges. Teachers by profession, Kiran Shankar Bhattacharjo, had taught in Brah Brahmananda Keshav Chandra College and Malda College before he had joined the Department of Political Science in North Bengal University. Serving that institute for decades till his retirement, he had nurtured innumerable students. Of them, some are well-known academics today. I am glad must be some of them could join this memorial lecture and thereby participate in the commemoration process. Meera Bhattacharjo Kanjilal, too, had been an educationist par excellence. And after serving some renowned institutions in Kolkata, she had created her own institution, Shishuti, in North Bengal, which is a well-known institution for children today. Our parents were never only our parents. They were fo focused to the outer world around, and we always have learned to share them along with 
they the world they had created addressed and nurtured i am so proud to acknowledge that the world class academic professor bashubi fraser who is to deliver the first memorial lecture uh, in the name of my parents today had known them from her early youth and had been very closely attached to them human life has its limitation they lived a long and meaningful life and had left us with rich and fond memories today's audience is a gathering of family friends students colleagues neighbors acquaintances and academics of various scholarships who had joined us to show their respect and com commitment to their fond memories i hope to carry on such a lecture program every year which will help us to carry forward their mission for imparting knowledge and make them immortal thank you over to you jyoti thank you uh, nondini uh, obviously your parents had a very inspiring life uh, inspired generations of students uh, generations of uh, people and uh, you know it is this idea of institution building uh, which uh, was uh, so very uh, you know uh, not just interesting but inspiring uh, i would now like to introduce uh professor bashobi fraser uh, who is the speaker for this evening i am indeed honored and humbled that the center for studies on borders and movements kolkata has invited me to chair this international webinar in memory of meera and kiran shankar bhattacharjee about whom we just heard a little bit only what gives me even more pleasure is that the speaker is professor emerita dr bashobi fraser of edinburgh napier university a long time friend and classmate it is just right that the chosen speaker in this forum is a creative writer poet academic and editor who has through her work built bridges across cultures to use the words of robindranath thakur koto ajanare janaile tumi koto ghore dile thai dur ke korile nikoto bondhu por ke korile thai translated by the poet himself thou hast made me known to friends whom i knew not thou hast given me seats in homes not my own thou hast brought the distant near and made a brother of the stranger i am uneasy at heart when i have to leave my accustomed shelter i forget that there abides the old in the new and there also thou abidest as acknowledgement of her achievement bashobi has been the recipient of the companion of the british empire 2021 uh, the queen's new year in in the queen's new year honors list for education that is academic achievements culture poetry and integration for working work connecting scotland and india i cannot even attempt to list all her 23 books nor mention all the prizes and honors that bashobi has been awarded so i have to be selective of the positions she holds currently she is director scottish uh, scottish center of tagore studies a royal literary fund fellow and an honorary fellow at the center for south asian studies edinburgh university of edinburgh an honorary fellow of the association of literary studies scotland quite a handful i think basha bay is trustee on the board of scottish pen the executive committee of writers at risk writers for peace poetry association of scotland she is honorary vice president of als trustee kolkata scottish heritage trust director of the patrick geddes trust she has written on patrick geddes and uh, shantiniketan and robindrana the chief ideator and president of the advisory board Inter intercultural poetry and performance library kolkata and advisory board member of the victoria and albert museum dundee She has worked with the Vice Chancellor of University of Bankura to set up the Indian Association of Scottish Studies, 
and is on the advisory board and professor emerita at that university i'm just talking about her recent publications patient dignity a poetry collection which was published in 2021 robindranath tagore a critical biography published in 2019 the ramayana a stage play and a screen play published in 2019 and my mum's sari a delightful you know a book 2019 her book partition bengal partition stories an unclosed chapter 2006 and 2008 was written with a british academy research grant and i think you know that was the first uh, full length book with a, a very very uh, interesting uh, uh, introduction uh, which uh, talked exclusively about the eastern uh, east bengal partition uh bashobi is the chief editor of the academic and creative peer reviewed international e journal gitanjali and beyond and is on the editorial board of the rlf writers mosaic bashobi is on the editorial board of several international peer reviewed journals and has been an adjudicator for many national and international creative writing competitions she is a rare combination to be sure of creativity and critical insight as evident from this much shortened list of achievements bashobi is an exceptional and uniquely talented person modest humane and friendly today bashobi whose expertise lies in post colonial literature and theory migration and diaspora transnationalism and transculturalism in the post modern world personal narratives and oral history will be talking on a space for articulation in a protracted struggle so it is uh, I, i will now you know leave uh, bashobi to uh, uh, this uh, to excite us with this her stimulating session to be followed by questions and answers so bashobi over to you thank you very much jyoti for that uh, very generous uh, introduction um jyoti as jyoti said is an old friend and a uh, close friend uh, closer in more senses than one because we seem to have always had uh, homes near each other uh, even now in kolkata we live in the same complex when i do go there so a very good uh, afternoon from edinburgh a very good evening to india uh and all my friends who have come today and those who I'm, i will hopefully get to know i just want to say joyti has also contributed to bengal partition stories so she was one of seven women translators and i'm very proud to say that they were all women inadvertently chosen for their capabilities um i would like to thank the center for borders and movement uh, uh in kolkata shati for um, beginning today Uh, for inviting me to deliver the inaugural lecture in a special series dedicated to the memory of Srimati Meera and Professor Kiran Shankar Bhattacharjee, uh, I will henceforth call them Meera Kakima and Kiran Kaku because that's how I knew them, uncle and auntie. My heartfelt thanks to Dr. Nondini Bhattacharya and Shri Pramukhaji for reaching out to me and letting me speak on a subject that remains very close to my heart. the effect of the bengal partition on all of us moreover the fact that i knew mira kakima and kiran kaku closely and the impact they had on my thoughts and ideas during a crucial part of my life makes this opportunity all the more poignant and uh, i think i would also like to add that um, uh, joyti as a woman uh, as a travel uh, critic travel writing critic has recorded a lot of women uh, women's experience which uh, i will try to do it in a different way about women in post partition bengal so thank you joyti for that preliminary work that you have already done and continue to do like my parents and grandparents mira kakima and kiran kaku were enforced migrants from across a border they had not anticipated 
would take away their Bhita Mati, their Bastu Bari, their ancestral land and home, and make the land of their birth and youth inaccessible after being uprooted. Those um, Kakima remembered the uh, sorry Kakima remembered the fear as houses burnt around her and she was forced to flee a homeland. Those flames would haunt her dreams and years to come. The politics of alienation and lack of a viable rehabilitation program in West Bengal for the partition migrants shaped Kaku's response, translated in a lifelong dedication to the cause of, mar of the marginalized. Both Kaku and Kakima were educationists. As education was often the only tool the impoverished middle-class East Bengali refugee could use as a key to a door that could lead from utter desti destitution to a regaining of some modicum of respectability. While Kaku was my parents' colleague at North Bengal University, a professor of political science, a subject to which he did full justice, Kakima was an entrepreneurial educationist who established Shishu Tito, as Nondini has already said, a school for primary education, which reflected the ethos of Rabindranath Tagore, where she was the able headmistress, a visionary working at the foundational level and ensuring a future for children, many of whose parents were from the grassroots. I must also add that Kakima was a beautiful Rabindra Shungit singer a Tagore song singer. And I had the privilege of dancing to her many renditions uh, on memorable occasions. It was wonderful seeing Kakima and Kaku nurture their three children, two of whom are present today, and launch them on hugely successful careers propped up by impressive higher education degrees. Nundini was a talented Indian classical dancer encouraged by her mother to learn and practice as the Bhattacharya family created a space for articulation for themselves, both professionally and creatively. And this is what I will be discussing in this lecture, how the Bengal partition which led to the dislocation and displacement, which meant that the East Bengali refugee had to find a space not just to exist, but to build a life for their own immediate family, relatives, and community, a space for their articulation in what was, as Prafula Chakrabutti has said, an agonizingly slow process. The influx of rec refugees has been continuous, as Ranubi Shamadda's book title suggests, Still They Come. And the outflux has been in waves following political upheavals and policies which have affected and threatened communal harmony. For the purposes of this talk, I will concentrate on the Hindu Bengali refugee from East Bengal in West Bengal, who were caught in a protracted struggle to survive, restore their dignity and social standing as they consciously moved from a sense of unbelonging in their ancestral land to a fresh sense of unbelonging in India and sought to establish their ownership of a nation which was initially hostile or indifferent to their presence, but which is indebted to the East Bengali refugee who has contributed to nation building. I am aware that I'm leaving out vast groups here, the Muslim exodus to East Pakistan and later Bangladesh, the dislocated seeking refuge in Tripura, Assam, Bihar, and Odisha, significant groups like the agricultural Namushudras in Assam or the Chakmas in the Chittagong Hill Tracts. A more comprehensive study of diverse groups will need a series of talks to do their narratives justice. Since this is a talk at the Center for Borders and Movement, I, movements, I will speak about the meaning and impact of the border on the movement of people who have been forced to cross it. As time is limited, I will give a few examples of each of the areas I wish to cover, namely the significance of what has been called a porous border and the implications of defying or enforcing it. The meaning of space, both private and public, especially in the lives 
of East Bengali women, and this is where Kakima's story becomes pertinent, and the assertion of citizenship rights and their contribution to a modern nation. In my introduction to Bengal partition stories and unclosed chapter, which I edited, I trace and analyze the events that led to the inevitable partition of India. So if we omit the Bengal story from the narrative of India's partition, we are left with a truncated history of the socio-political reality that contributed to the vivisection of the subcontinent on religious grounds. I will refer to some stories in Bengal partition uh, stories and make brief references to pertinent films to underscore the way in which migrants have found a space for articulation. It might not be fully satisfying, but I hope some of it will resonate with you. In most socio-historical accounts of the partition, the story of the actual people who suffered from the drawing of the shadow line is seldom documented. For a long time, there was a silence around the personal experiences of individuals and families affected by the border. There were many theories explaining the silence. And a dominant one is that a long passage of time is ne necessary before people can talk about atrocities they have witnessed and endured and even inflicted, which are too close to their memories. Another theory is one I cover in my introduction. This is the reality of a prolonged struggle in the post-partition era of the Bengali refugee to survive and eke out an existence in a society where they were not made welcome and where they were not even and where they were even considered aliens uh, by our first prime minister, Jawaharlal Nehru, which made the prospect of reminiscences based on memory, evoking nostalgia and a sense of longing for a lost homeland, at best a remote possibility and at worst a luxury they had no time to indulge in. As such, there is a danger of the story of these displaced millions being lost and irrecoverable. While there has been a plethora of political histories, there is a dearth of social histories of people affected by the border. This is where literature and film create a space for articulation. Built on realist experiences and eyewitness accounts to provide an alternative archive which document realist experiences uh, and, and translate them to the mythical. Literature then acts as an alternative archive. It pits the little narrative against the grand narrative of history. It offers the unofficial verse, uh, versus the official verse, uh, version of the story of the subaltern, the marginal women and men who suffer at times of human upheaval and man-made calamities born of conflict. The announcement of the Radcliffe boundary line after the formation of Pakistan and Indian independence in August 1947 created a 4,000 kilometer border which territorialized what was initially one nation. But far from creating two unified homogeneous societies, it has thrown into relief the inevitable existence of multiple shared cultures, economies and societies. Through time, the Bengal border has been increasingly reinforced through fencing, policing, patrolling, and even landmines, which have made crossing the shadow line for everyday purposes hazardous and even dangerous. William Van Schendel in the borderland, Bengal borderland, beyond state and nation in South Asia, actually uh, studies this complexity uh, intensively. I will now relate my own experience of visiting the border at Changrabadha in North Bengal, which was open for brief periods to let traders in the informal sector and farmers and relatives through. There was a sleepy sentry on the Indian side who's, who stopped one visitor from the other side and asked, where are my eggs? The man said the hens had not been lay laying recently but he would find eggs next time. He was allowed to pass through. The sentry offered cigarettes to another man who passed an unidentified bag of goods to him. It was a barter which apparently worked for both sides. Unlike the sealed border in the West, 
The eastern border's porousness is evidenced in the border crossings and the cross-border cultivation that has continued for years without much trouble as families adopted creative strategies to circumvent the new borderline, as observed by Talbot and Singh. But all encounters are not so laid back as mine on Chandrabada. As the exchange of fire across the boundary line, of people trying to slip through the stretches of no man's land and being shot at and killed by the border security forces occur from time to time. Incidents which do not necessarily make the headlines but are witnessed by those who live close to this hapless line. In the final story in Beng of Bengal partition stories, a barbed wire fence is being erected to reinforce the reality of the border between West Bengal and Bangladesh after the events of the demolition of the Babri Masjid. Here, the question of belonging and nation become problematic. Oluka's family has come to India from Borishal on the other side, before she was born, while Shubis came with his family in 1965 during the time of the Indo-Pak War. However, or the freedom for Bangladesh War. However, their friend Mazaru has stayed in India with his family for seven generations, while his two uncles with his beautiful favorite aunt migrated to East Pakistan in 1953, following the 1950 violence on both sides of the border, which prompted a two-way flow of people across Bengal's porous border. The title, Wild Goose Country, Bonohong Deshe by Amur Mitra, indicates that the no man's land between the two divided countries. Mazaru insists that the flying specks they have spotted the previous night are geese, not enemy planes. As the lone goose separated from its flock indicates. The lonely goose is reminiscent of the many who got separated from their families as they fled searching for a refuge beyond new battle lines of nation state boundaries. The proposition of making religion determine one's nation becomes problematic in the story. At the border, the friends meet Omul Bhattacharya, who has remained in East Pakistan. He brings news of Mazarul's Chotopishi, his youngest aunt, who has been like an affectionate surrogate mother to Omul. While Oluk and Shubir step over the shadow line to experience the country their families were uprooted from, Mazarul holds on to the barbed wire till it cuts through his fingers, refusing to cross the invisible line of demarcation, unwilling to leave his familial, familiar contact zone to venture into another nation created by conflict. And how does one divide flowing water between nations? The border, the Bengal border, runs through 1,000 kilometers of water sometimes following the streams, creating a volatile landscape where rivers change course, alluvial deltas appear, and whole islands with thriving populations disappear, affected by an increasingly unpredictable tide. The line between the self and the other is blurred in the ironic story entitled Alien Land, Angina Bidesh, by Onnuda Shankar Rai. Here, the disputed waters of the river in Delta Ike, Bengal defy demarcation, as do the people on either side of the border, which separates farmers from their land and crops and interrupts the fishermen's livelihood. However, the people continue to work as they have done for centuries, despite the border. The narrator of the story is visiting his friend who is suffering from a fever, and his wife thinks he's delirious as he keeps muttering what sounds like, don't fret, pomfret, to his wife, gibberish. However, as the friend explains, it is a kind of special mantra. He tells him how pomfret, an ocean launch, once got stuck on the sandbanks of this chameleon tide country, which was forever being transformed, transformed by the ruling tide. At this point, his nightmare, of his nightmare, the pomfret, drifting into enemy waters and being captured or being carried to the sea 
and become and and being lost destroys his peace of mind he gives the responsibility of rescuing the pomfret to the muslim boatman who had always managed to maneuver boats to safety his junior colleagues are horrified what have you done sir but the friend is confident in their indian loyalty he says but they have never betrayed us till now and i don't think they will ever do so he is proved right as we hear that the boatman the sarin tandels anticipating an imminent flood in a pre preemptive move board the launch as soon as the pomfret sails into the waters they start the engine he says one should not distrust a man just for his religious beliefs whatever you preserve today comes to your rescue later on migrants carry the elsewhere their erstwhile erstwhile homeland with them their customs and culture affect the society they settle in while they too are affected by their place of arrival this third space the contact zone witnesses the articulation of difference according to homi bhava where migrants contribute to a, creating a hybrid society societies are thus by and large naturally pluralist and it is when attempts are made to carve out and create monolithic societies that the process of othering becomes necessary to draw lines of demarcation between communities and contact zones which could signify a confluence are transformed into conflict zones where they clash and grapple as established residents view the influx of newcomers as an invasion the creation of the other after decolonization has sought the outsider amongst the migrant population who assumed the insider outsider status as they combated a mindless system that questioned or denied their very identity even when they were dedicated to the arduous task of trying to fit in okay. okay shall i somebody has just told me that i am not loud enough can you hear me now yes bashubidi i think that was uh, uh, an internal conversation which just got heard so please carry on you're okay okay so um yeah migrants who were trying to integrate in what often became a hostile environment as one third of the earlier bengal province was expected to provide a haven to the east bengal refugee whole families who entered the state congregated in railway stations occupied parks and when government sucker was not forthcoming in desperation they set up makeshift homes in what are called squatter colonies in abandoned barracks marshy or swampy and fallow land along railway lines and these names will mean a lot to people uh, from bengal in kolkata in jadavpur dhakuria taliganj bijaygarh behala domdom barakpur belgachia boranagor kamarhati barashat shodpur srirampur khorda titagarh kachrapara shamnagar expanding uh, expanding calcutta cityscape to create a suburbia the deputy mayor of kolkata ps basu in 1954 described these colonies as illegal occupation and squatting on public and private land these communities put a strain on urban amenities but they also contributed to the socio economics of the city as skilled educated and entrepreneurial newcomers as kirun kaku and kakima have done the refugees strove to create the villages or towns they had left behind with colony markets post offices schools refugee councils offices including government offices for example in bijayagarh uh, in bijayagarh colony they built four high schools for both boys and girls and college the first such institution established in a refugee colony what they facilitated was a socio cultural transformation in the new nation state alternative political movements in the communist party subsequently made inroads into the grassroots amongst the impoverished and disenfranchised refugees in camps and squatter colonies colonies for the my western friends uh, means neighborhoods in this context 
to galvanize a growing population into making their voice heard and heeded. This is what the Communist Party of India did as they demanded citizenship and civic rights such as sanitation, drinking water, electricity, and the right to have a stake in the democratic process. It was not an easy journey to legitimize the position of the East Bengal refugee, but a struggle that encountered resistance at state level. Violence by, uh, uh, by law enforcement police and court cases, which dragged on for decades, prolonging the decades of uncertainty for the partition migrants. Debish Roy's story, oh. Refugee Udvastu, reads, which reads like a dark comedy, lays bare the travesty of justice, which alleges Shotabrata Lahiri, the head of a refugee family in the story, as not the son of Punnabrata Lahiri, as Shotabrata has died along the journey of migration. It claims Onima, which happens to be my mother's name, Onima is not his wife, but the wife of, a, of an enamel Karim with the adopted name of Kum Kum. Subsequently, the daughter of Shotabrata and Onima Lahiri Anjali is not their daughter, as she was born seven months after their wedding. The allegations continue to assert that the house Shottabrata has had registered at Bollapur Registration Office on 10th June 1950 is under false pretext, as it still belongs to Sheikh Manzur Ali, who has returned to India to reclaim his property following the 1950 uh, Liaquat Nehru Pact. The fact that Shrotabrata claims to be a graduate of Dhaka University but cannot produce a certificate to prove this as he was forced to flee the partition violence proves that he is lying till he can prove otherwise. Onima is alleged to have been left behind when her family emigrated as construed from circumstantial evidence. The modicum of respe respectability gained by the Lahiri family in a flimsy shelter with a meager income and an education and future in sight for their daughter is challenged and negated by a bizarre UN agenda, which makes them persona non grata till they can establish that they are who they claim to be. The court battle which invades Onima's private life and claws at her identity is reflected in diverse experiences of women who suddenly found the line between their private and public spaces blurred. In East Bengal, they had enjoyed the privacy of inner courtyards, their Ondar Mohal, the rooms around the inner courtyard, their own Kirki Pukur, the ponds which were sheltered from the public or male gaze. In the colonies, and in rented accommodation, privacy was an unheard of luxury. Kitchens could be under the stairway or on verandas and shared bathrooms and taps proved no sanctity of a protected existence. We note the difference between the Bhadra Mohila Shamaj, the respectable women of society, middle classes, of older residents and the refugee women walking the streets in Calcutta, in Munindra Roy's poem, Ekane Akhon, Here, Now. And this is a translation by uh, Devjani Shengupta. Office returning babus look out of tram windows on the crowded Moidan. A meeting takes place. Women watch, braiding hair from second floors refugee mothers walking. The colony in May, the girl from the colony was frowned upon. The implications of the prostitute mother versus respectable homebound mother seething under the reference. Nimai Ghosh's Chinnumul, a path-breaking film made in 1950, traces such a tale in the travails of a refugee couple, Govindu and Shumurti, from Naldanga East Bengal, as they battled to find a secure space for articulation in Calcutta, starting in Shelda Station. Many refugee women became breadwinners of their family, as my mother and all my aunties did. 
uh, on my mother's side and and Kirun Kakima too, of their family. Like Nita in Meghita Katara, Cloud Capped Star, a film directed by Ritik Ghatak in 1960, based on Shokti Pado Rajguru's fiction. Or for example, Aruti in Shotojit Rai's Mohanagar, the big city, the great city, based on Narendra Mitra's Abhutaranika. The Bengali refugee woman, uh, woman competed with her male counterpart for jobs in offices, factories, and mills, subverting the idea of a woman confined to the domestic space of the home. As Devjani Shengupta points out, the working refugee woman moved between her inner and outer life, the home and the street, protecting her home from police raids and goons hired by landlords while negotiating with the government for recognition and approved residency. The Mohila Shomitis, the women's committees, uh, uh, and their allegiance to the Communist Party, seeing them actively involved in public meetings and marches as they wrote petitions and moved motions to make their spaces habitable with civic amenities. They willingly engendered a transformation of their person in their dress, their speech and intonation, their gait and demeanor. Uh, this is interesting because my, my father's family was from Chittagong and my mother's from Dhaka. And uh, they both spoke their home dialects, but in the public space, they didn't. They were, as Gargi Chakraborty notes, Bengal's new women embodying modernity, self-reliant, responsible, independent, capable, efficient, courageous, and caring. Our generation and the next owe a huge debt to them, as they and our fathers and grandfathers were nation builders on the ground, with no fancy dreams except to build a new life from scratch, create a space for their children to express themselves in and contribute to the land they were driven to after political upheaval engendered by a border. In Devi Shroy's story, The Debt of a Generation, the narrator is Shiva Brutu, who works in a Kolkata office. The story opens on 9th November, Shiva Brutu's birthday, which goes unnoticed by his colleagues, but which stirs memories of his late father's, I quote, calm and reassuring presence, and his late mother's, I quote again, loving eyes which urged the deity's blessings on her son on his birthday. In the year of the partition, the family had walked across the border at Horidashpur, leaving behind long memories and the history of a family rooted in Narayan Ganj. Both his father and his uncle, Shiva Brutus Pishamoshai, had joined maternal uncle, sorry, uh, his uh, father's sister's husband, Pishamoshai. It's very difficult in English, isn't it? Uh, both of them had decent jobs in, Ta in the Taka Corporation. But once they are displaced, while his father does find employment with the public works department, his uncle remains jobless. He manages to arrange an unofficial exchange of his Narangat property with a Muslim gentleman's property in uh, Bhagavan Gola in Mushidabad. Here he tries farming but fails to make ends meet. He sells everything and returns to Kolkata, where his wife and daughter eke out a meager existence with Renuka, their eldest, selling the newspaper uh, packets her mother makes. The father slowly loses his mind and finally disappears, spotted crossing the border, seeking his ancestral Narayan Ganj. The family's relentless search fails to locate him. Renuka's self-sacrificing life is emblematic of many Bengali women in post-partition days who grew old before their time as they remained the breadwinners of their family. Shiva Brutus Renudi manages to pass her school final exam, find a job, save money to invest in gold jewelry, and finally arrange for her sister's marriage. The jewelry is for her sister, not herself. Shiva Brutus recalls his dignified mother's calm walk through filth as she visited their family, Renuka's family, in the slum along the canal. This is where Renuka is left alone and suffers from pleurisy. On this particular 9th November, 
a Jibun Ghosh, a gentleman, visits Shivabrata with a handwritten note from Renudi. Once, when her cousin had visited her, she told him of her sense of loneliness and a feeling of a dead father's presence calling her. I quote, Renu, my dear, aren't you come going, uh, going to go home? Unquote. On this visit, visit, she hesitantly asks the narrator, what if now, at the age of 42, if I end up getting married, will that make me a laughing stock? Shibabrata realizes the man sitting opposite him is the compounder whom Renudi had spoken about. He had nursed Renu through her pleurisy, a widower with a little girl whom Renu loved, the man she wanted to marry. But Renudi has just committed suicide. Women like Renu cannot escape the old ghosts. She is called away once her task is fulfilled of supporting her mother and marrying off her sister. Shivabrutu's love, Ranjuna, had told him earlier, I quote, partition was such a long time ago. Neither you nor I was born then, so there was no way we could be responsible for it. But look at us now, the whole responsibility has been thrust on us. Unquote. The Renudis, Shubhabrutus, Shubhabrutus and Ranjunas, the Shottabrutus and Onimas, the Nitas and Aratis, the Govindus and Shumotis bear the burden of the post-partition struggle. Yet their struggles are ones we have read and seen in literature and films and in the life stories of our parents and grandparents handed down to us and we should cherish and archive their stories which have given us a place in today's India. The conflict zone has been transformed into a context zone of pluralist reality. The East Bengali has proudly proclaimed her or his Bengal roots while embracing a West Bengali identity. The East Bengali new women, women and men have en enhanced and augmented Indian society in diverse ways. In February 2014, I was invited to do two keynote lectures on the Bengal partition in two of West Bengal's universities. My trip coincided with my cousin, my Borumashi, my eldest uh, uh, auntie's daughter's son's wedding. At the wedding, while I stood sipping coffee in the balmy winter air of Kolkata, outside the Biyabari, the wedding house, many personable, handsome, young women and men came forward and introduced themselves to me as this cousin's daughter and that cousin's son. I asked them what they did and where they were based. They were from Mumbai, Delhi, Bangalore, Hyderabad, Bhopal, Australia, or America. They were accomplished, successful, and hugely self-confident. I realized that it had taken four generations from the time of my grandparents' displacement in August 1947 for their grandchildren to find a space for articulation in India. It had indeed been a protracted struggle. I would like to request the Center for Borders and Movements to think of a collaborative effort in had establishing a partition archive of memories involving both Bangladesh and West Bengal to archive the memories of the generations who have made our future and our children's and grandchildren's future possible. Thank you very much and thank you for listening. Uh, I think uh, we should be, that was uh... You know, extremely interesting and extremely insightful lecture. And I think uh, we should have some questions uh, which uh, our listeners uh, would like to ask. Uh, Shikra, um, are you? Are there any I questions? Think no, in no, Nondini uh, has put up her hand. Uh, Nandini Bhattacharya? Mane, the other there, we have two Nandini Bhattacharyas here today. This is uh, Nondini from Badhwan University. Mm. Okay. Okay. Uh, go ahead, Nondini, and uh, ask your question. 
Yes, Joy Tidhi. And a very good evening to you and a very good evening to Bashwiti uh, and to all present. My, you know, this is uh, more of an evocative kind of a uh, lecture and therefore my intervention is also in the nature of the lecture. And uh, it's simply my point is that the partition that one is talking about is a is not a partition of class. Bashovidi, when you are speaking about that, when I'm speaking about that, we are aware that we have carried our cultural capital from that side to this side. Whereas, the, therefore, the integration or going off to Australia or England or whatever the later uh, movements happen, that is not exactly like the, the statelessness, for example, that uh, the underclass would suffer. Their partition would really wreck lives, as they have in the case of the people of Chitmahul. Since you did mention uh, Amor Mitro and Kumari Meghet Deshning, Deshchai. So if you would, uh, you know, speak a little about the partition of class and the, the effects of such real lines that when, when uh, such people are moved from one place to another. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, uh, you raised some very pertinent points, Nondini. Thank you. Uh, I think my last example showed how uh, the, it, it had taken four generations. That's what I realized for uh, after partition to suddenly to finally find their feet. And the kind of mobility we see in that generation uh, is is something that the more impoverished classes would not have been able to uh, enact in their lives. They, the mobility, they had no mobility. And they, at the most, they could move from Shialda Station to a colony, or they were shepherded into Dandakarun or uh, various um, dry fallow places, which farmers cannot um, even cultivate. So if we look at the kind of, in a way, it was, uh, uh, you know, the the poor really suffered. The middle classes might have had some uh, capital in their education, but the work, I did mention that I, I would not be looking at the Namoshudras and those who, uh, uh, who, who, who were our agriculturalists uh, in this. In this, I was really looking at the city dwellers in this particular paper. So I think the the class struggle was something that the Communist Party of India did in cash uh, in their own political interests, which actually helped many people to finally get the, uh, the ration cards they needed, uh, which is equivalent to the green card in America. So I think uh, in answer to your question, I would say that I need another whole paper to write about the impoverished classes. In fact, in, in uh, my, my Bengal partition stories, uh, in which I work with famous writers from both sides of the border, translated 39 stories uh, in a very capable um, manner, uh, needs a follow-up. And that is where we, we could look at uh, different classes who continue to suffer, for example, in Tripura or uh, Assam and even in Bengal. I would also say that um, what I haven't looked at are uh, people who are considered infiltrators even today, you know, those who are coming back looking for, um, for security and the land, ancestral land they left behind. In fact, there is one story in Bengal partition stories called Infiltrators, where we, we find people coming back 
to the ancestral villages in Bihar. So I think uh, a lot of, I, I haven't, I've just picked out some stories which look at board, the border and the movements rather than uh, have a huge uh, raft of examples. And for that, I think I will need two more lectures, Nandini. So I hope that answers your question. Uh, I mobility is something that uh, only four generations later, that's what struck me when I met these young, they kept saying, you are Pishi, you are Mashi, Pul Pishi, Pul Mashi, depending on which side of my maternal and paternal side they came from. It was quite interesting. And I just thought, this is the confidence we didn't have when we were growing up because we witnessed our parents and grandparents economic struggle if nothing else i think uh, there is a question in the chat box um, by mangala uh, gauri there is a one hand raised here nondini shin i would like to yes and ajay Patnaik, yeah. Shall we take uh, Mangala Gauri's Chakraborty's uh, question first, Chaitidin, then I can read it out? Yes, yes, I think uh, so. I think so. When the, okay. when the migrant women began to work shoulder to shoulder with men, vying for the same jobs, did that affect gender roles at home? Um, that's, that is a very good question. I. I don't think in, in those times it did. They, they just, the women just multitasked. They came back and they cooked and kept home and kept it uh, clean and cozy. And, uh, but I think in the marketplace, yes, uh, they, they were perceived as taking away the men's jobs as well. So I don't think their roles changed at home at all. I mean, as I said, my mother, my Mashis, Kiron Kakima herself, they all worked. Uh, all of them worked in government offices, in education. I have never seen them have cooks, have the luxury of having cooks. My mother did later on, but not my, uh, my aunties. So there we are, I think. Uh, so I, I think the answer is they continued their roles as homemaker and worker in the market space. Shipra, there are two more questions. Uh, yes, there is uh, the, uh, there is another in the chat box. Maybe we can take this and then we can move into uh, Nondini Shen and Professor Patnaik's uh, question. Uh, this is uh, from Professor Shonjukta Dajukto. She says, brilliant, Bashubi. More so as my parents grew up in Chiragong and my father was a very precautious courier boy, Shurjo Shen. My Great grandfather was the founder of the Chittagong Municipal Model High School, evocated as Nandini said. So this is more of a comment. Uh, yes, Jaidi, we can move into the questions now. Thank you, yes. Shamjuk, for that. We have Chittagong connections then. Chattagram or Chatgaya, as we say. Gaya, as we say. I couldn't resist that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, um, I think, I think Nandini has a question. Nondini Shen has a question which you would like to ask. Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, Mashobidi, thank you, thank you, thank you very much for the fascinating talk. Uh, I have a question uh, for you. Uh, I am a very, I'm a very mixed person. Uh, my mama buddy or my maternal side is from Bangladesh and my paternal side is from Calcutta uh, for generations. Uh, so I have seen so many differences between the two households. Uh, the paternal side uh, is, uh, was already uh, very, uh, a, very rich in their culture, uh, economically, uh, and uh, in other terms also, though the uh, though the paternal and the maternal uh, sides are from the same caste, but I can observe that as my maternal side came from Bangladesh, uh, they uh, they lost uh, their class uh, means economic class. Uh, 
uh, and they also had to leave behind their culture capital. Uh, so, and after that, uh, through my marriage and through my uh, current partnership, I have seen that uh, both of means both of their families are from Bangladesh. Uh, I have seen that uh, the people who have come from or who have migrated from Bangladesh, they are very hardworking. Uh, than the people who are from uh, this side, means from the Indian side. Uh, so how will you explain uh, this uh, fall of class or fall means or leaving behind their cultural capital and the uh, question of hard work, uh, of hard work by the people uh, from uh, the Bangladesh side? Well, um, I think um, I, I would hesitate to generalize, um, you know, uh, in such terms, but I think it is, uh, not only you raise a pertinent point in that those who migrate have by nature of the fact that they have to re uh, resend their roots into a new land have to be hardworking. Those who already have uh, are settled in the land to which the migrants come, have a certain sense of economic security, whether it's a house they've inherited or the land that they till. So it's quite, uh, or, or the land that they own. But a migrant comes with nothing except the cultural capital and the urge for education, which may be the key, as I say in my paper, to a future, an assured future. So maybe that could be the reason. I mean, it's a huge joke uh, here that um, South Asians work very hard in Britain. And yet uh, on the subcontinent, there is a tendency to think of them as quite lazy, <laughs> but that's not true. I mean, India is growing and, uh, and Bangladesh is doing very well. And uh, so is Pakistan. So I think, Nondini, in answer to your question, initially, uh, people have to work very hard to find a footing to establish themselves and to regain their respectability. And people who already have all this don't need to start from scratch. And maybe that is the reason that we see a certain difference. Does that answer your question? I mean, I remember my father and mother they uh, my father taught in uh, you know uh, mor morning day and night college to keep a family going on both sides my mother taught morning and day you know shifts so in a sense my father had three jobs uh, in those days uh, university college jobs were very badly paid so he needed three jobs and my mother had two jobs now, if they had been a West Bengali family, they could have just had one job because they would have had the house to live in, maybe some land to fall back on, but not because the West Bengalis were lazy, but because they had a sense of security that my parents didn't have. So I hope this answers your question. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, there was Ajoy who was wanting to ask a question. Yeah, this is Ajay Patnaik from JNU. Yes. Yes. Hello, Ajay. Hello. Hello, Professor. That was a very, very good narration. Learned a lot from it. Thank I think you. Nandini gave me a book also on partition story. Uh, my question is very simple because I like to know this expression that is used, Bengal. Is it is it used for poorer non bhadralok Bangladesh uh, refugees or for everybody in general? Um, that, <laughs> that, 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 that's a great question. <laughs> uh, Bangals are from the, across the eastern side of the border and Gopis are from the western side of the border. For a long time to be a Bangal was considered uh, you know, to be rustic and unsophisticated. 
uh, and uh, well, my family definitely is Bengali, <laughs> uh, but no. So, I mean, my question was uh, it's not class different. based. What, no, not status based. No, Can no. a West Bengal Bhadralok address Bhadralok from Bangladesh? There are Bhadraloks in East Bengal also. Yeah. Oh, Can, yeah. You, call, can you call me a Bangal? Uh, uh, call Bangal? Yeah, that's a yes. I think Bangal means somebody from across the border, but it came to signify somebody who was not sophisticated enough. But it wasn't class based. But I think what has happened uh, in subsequent decades after partition is that the Bangals have actually appropriated the term Bangal uh, and are quite vociferous uh, in saying, yes, we are Bangals. And that is it. Thank you. <laughs> so I think we, uh, you know, uh, identity. Thank you. Thank you. Yes? This is Shuparna Banerjee here. I would uh, like to ask you one a question. It was a very uh, a insightful as well as intimate lecture. Thank you for that. Uh, what I would like to ask you is, would you like to draw any uh, comparison uh, between the mass migration that we witnessed uh, during the Bengal partition with the uh, migration that we see all around today in the, uh, I mean, the transnational migration that is happening all around us today. Are there any political or religious fundamentalist connections uh, between these two or are they uh, totally uh, you know, different uh, sorts of migrations? Yeah, I mean, a good question, Shuparna. Thank you. In my introduction, I do mention uh, parallels with various migratory movements uh, which have uh, happened because of uh, conflict, political conflict. Uh, and uh, so the, there are always going to be similarities. But I think the Indian partition, uh, which sort of saw the displacement of uh, any, uh, the estimate today is 18 million people through time. Uh, is something that cannot be paralleled by any other uh, event in, in, in our memories. So uh, I think uh, that in itself makes it different. But um, I think migrants are not just born of conflict uh, and, and uh, religious politics. But also the whole idea of creating the other, uh, you know, within societies is something we uh, so-called civilized uh, 21st century societies continue to do. We need the other to assert ourselves, right. to make, to, to create differences, so, which is very unfortunate. So I think Edward Said, the whole idea of the Orientalist project of creating the other, the enemy within, is something that we, perhaps some of us can combat by our own sense of humanity. Thank you, Zili. I hope that answers your question, Shuparna. Yeah, yeah, to a very large extent, yes. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Shipra, there are some more questions. Uh, uh, just, just a minute. Uh, I'm sorry to I'm, I'm uh, interrupting for a while because an interesting point came to my mind in relation to uh, Mr. Ajay Patnaik's question. He was asking you if there are any class connotations to this division between Bangal and Ghoti. He didn't use the word Ghoti. I would like to add, uh, uh, I mean, my own observation here that although, uh, like uh, Bashubidi said, there are no uh, clear cut class connotations, there is this connotation of a lack of sophistication. And also, I think. Over the time, uh, over the uh, uh, you know decades, there emerged a uh, you know uh, a perception that the Bangals are more of a uh, you know more uh, spunky, more uh, spirited, and more of go-getters. I mean, there's this. Uh, I'm a purebred Goti myself, not a Bangal. So I think this is uh, this is more of a uh, you know social uh, de demarcation than uh, a class-based one. It just occurred to me that uh, we we tend to associate the word Bangal with uh, you know in, with spunk, with zest, uh, with the spirit of uh, you know uh, 
করে দেখাবো am i right am do you uh, well i mean i think the core cases uh, is, uh, you know how to sort of justify that the bangals were involved in numerous court cases uh, trying to establish right, their right. they had to struggle a lot yes i think all refugees struggle shuparna don't they i mean right. and migrants do struggle yeah. wherever they are so i think that's inevitable yeah so there is a sense um, of respect know, also towards the bangals we we respect them a lot because of their that history of struggle and their uh, you know resilience the spirit of resilience that they showed thank you thank you thank you um i just have a comment to make out here i don't think i'm really qualified to speak because i'm tamil but my mother in law was bangal and uh, i have often been there family occasions they never used the term bangal it was always aideshi and oideshi so when they were talking about the marriage of third generation you know their generation they generally got married to somebody from the same part of bengal so somebody from dhaka got married to somebody from dhaka somebody from moimonsingh married somebody from moimonsingh then the next generation there were mixed marriages you know somebody from dhaka married somebody from kumilla that was okay and then of course uh, people got married you know i mean most people started considering themselves from kolkata from india the third generation so then uh, they would say oh bota to ei desh you know something like that i never mm-hmm. heard them use the word bangal yeah thank you mangula i think you you are very much uh, qualified to make a comment uh you know because partition actually affected everybody right across the subcontinent uh i just want to say uh, tell a little story with joyty's permission in this context yes, of course <laughs> my grandmother my uh, paternal grandmother uh, who was from chitagong one day uh, said that so and so married a foreign girl so i was very intrigued i said takuma uh, was this foreign girl from america or from uh, from england and, and she said no no she was from borishal so which <laughs> meant she was not from chitagong <laughs> so you know the whole idea of otherness can be that somebody is not from the place you are from which can be quite funny when it doesn't have any implications of conflict coming with it right uh shipra are there any more questions in the chat yes, box yes. i think that there is another question there is one comment by uh, professor fakrul alam i think he has had to leave he has just reminded us uh, that today is jibanananda dash's death anniversary and uh, partition was very very difficult for him difficult experience yes. there is yeah. one question from uh, obhijit bhattacharya who asks belonging to the third generation of refugee families i would like to know how memories travel through generations and how patriarchy intervenes in the framing of such memories hmm. good question i think um patriarchy uh, is kind of dominant discourse uh, and will remain the dominant discourse and uh, so uh, but a lot of good women scholars have come forward and documented women stories so if i look at both sides of the border one can uh, see urvashi butalia but can uh, ritu menon kamla basin who have actually documented a lot of women stories on uh, the bengal border um, we have uh joshodhara the um with uh, shubharanjun documenting a lot of women stories and of course we have devjani chengupta also doing the same so i think uh, and uh, this is where work uh, like that of uh, joyti and shomdatta and uh, others who have worked on women travelers coming that women can work on women and bring to light their experiences because patriarchy will remain the dominant discourse but what we need is not for uh, women to transform themselves but for men to be transformed for all stories to be heard documented 
an outcome. Right. Um, yeah, I any more questions, uh, Shipra? Or anyone else would like, like to comment? Yeah. If somebody would like to comment, you can please unmute yourself and just see. I think uh, the one is coming forward now. Uh, so, Shipra, uh, I think uh, it's from the center that you are going to offer a vote of thanks. Yes. Yes, thank you, Jai Yes, uh, I will be giving Shupra, the vote before of you, thanks. Uh, sorry, Shupra, uh, do you mind if I interrupt a little? I know Pukrul had to leave, and uh, he did remind us about Jibanananda Dash. I just want to say, Pukrul himself has done a very uh, uh, an excellent, I should say, translation of Jivananda Dash's poetry into English, if people want to read it. The anthology that Fokrul has um, yes. translated. So thank you. Sorry, Shipra, for interrupting. No, no, thank you. Thank you, uh, Vashidi. Yes, uh, this is Professor Fokrul Alam's work that uh, Professor Fraser was uh, uh, speaking about. Uh, I will be giving the vote of thanks since Professor Swati Ghosh had to leave uh, uh, the meeting, uh, which will bring today's program to a close. On uh, behalf of the Center for Studies on Borders and Movements, my first thanks is to the audience for your questions, for your participation, for your attention, and for the time, without which any program is completely uh, falls flat on its face. Uh, I thank our speaker today, Professor Bashidi Fraser, and our chair, Professor Jyoti Gupto, for uh, joining us today and for helping us concretize a very dearly held wish uh, of our friend, uh, colleague, member, Nundini Bhattacharya. Uh, Bashubidi, we will remember your suggestion of the archive. In fact, uh, uh, Nundini will tell you that we are beginning work already upon that. And we are trying to focus, if possible, uh, in accordance with Nondini's inclinations, focus on the positive stories coming out of the partition, the help, the intercommunal help that we see uh, as against the darker stories that have been uh, 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 documented. Uh, uh, for all the mysterious, invisible technical work that goes on uh, in the background, and which uh, enables us to hold such programs. We thank our friend and uh, member, Ritu Parna Roy Chaudhary. And with that, we bring our program to a close today. Thank you, everybody, so much for attending or participating in this memorial lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all for joining. Hope we will meet again. Thank you, Vipashubiti. And thank, thank you, you all my friends and relatives for joining here and all the academia who took interest in this. Thanks a lot. A pleasure. Thank you.